Welcome to episode number five of the National Land Realty Podcast, where we discuss all things land. Our goal here is to inform, educate, and entertain those of you who own land or are interested in the buying and selling of land throughout the United States. My name is Mac Christian, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at National Land Realty. I'll be your host for this episode. Today, our topic will be land financing, where we will learn about how exactly the process of buying land with a lender works. Landline Lending President Jeremy Stevens and Client Care Coordinator Susan Floyd are here to speak with us. Jeremy hails from Little Rock, Arkansas. He's an accredited land consultant accredited by the Realtors Land Institute, a past president of the Realtors Land Institute, and is past education chair of the land of RLI. He's also Arkansas chapter president for RLI. He has over 20 years of experience in real estate. He's a three-time agent of the year with his former real estate company, a Realtors Land Institute top producer from 2017 to 2020, and National Land Realty's top producer in Arkansas from 2016 to 2020. He has a BS in agriculture from Arkansas State University. He loves working with duck hunting properties, timberland, and commercial development. Susan Floyd is a graduate of Clemson University, where she earned a Bachelor in Science in Management. Before working with Landline Lending, she served as Director of Marketing for National Land Realty, where she started in 2008 and eventually earned the distinction of Chief Operations Officer before moving to Landline. These are two people who know every facet of lending in the land industry. Now, sit back and enjoy the show. I am recording. Um, All right, so this week's episode of the National Land Podcast, we have here uh, Susan Floyd and Jeremy Stevens out of uh, National Land Realty. And today we're going to be discussing the ins and outs of financing land, uh, you know, the, the, the financing behind it, buying the purchase decision, how, how cash flow can work while you own the property as far as generating income and sort of the refining, refin- let, me, let me try that again, refinancing process uh, and, and how that sort of works. But first of all, uh, Susan, Jeremy, I wanted to give you both sort of a chance to, to tell me how you got here. How did you end up with Landline Lending and, and National Land Realty? Thanks, Mac. I'll start out. Um, you know, I've been in the real estate business for 20 some odd years. In a previous career, I was in, in, in agriculture and land finance. I worked through the farm credit system five or six years before I chose to go into, into real estate brokerage. And, and dealing in brokerage and dealing in finance, it kind of gives you a good idea of, of how both sides of, of, of the aisle work. Um, joined National Land and uh, was continuing the brokerage and we came up with the idea of, of some of the areas that we service were in a, a dire need of a, of a solid land finance program. Um, there are many areas that we service that have great programs, great uh, great op- banking opportunities, lending opportunities, but there were some that didn't. So we came up with a plan and we uh, we started landline lending. And uh, I've been working with that now for probably close to three years, uh, you know, starting out from a just small spot and we've you know developed it into a larger broader scale uh, but uh, with the experience that we have and uh, from the lending side and also the brokerage side we felt like it gave us a little bit of a leg up especially working with agents and brokers because we see both sides we know what we know we know what they want we know what they're going to ask uh, you know the questions they may have uh, and we feel like we're, we're a little bit better in tune to tell them you know here's what we can do here's how we can do it and, and just be honest with them and so, yeah, and as far as, you know, you both work with the, the lending and financing of land and, and I always like to approach like half the time I say like you, you, you feign ignorance to get the right information, but half the time I'm really ignorant. So it's like, you know, I, I don't have to fake a whole lot to get, to get a lot of the base information. Um, but walk me through sort of the ins and outs and, and the, the easiest comparison to talk to real estate for, uh, for land would be to compare it to residential because a lot of people come into land. And I, you know, we, we have a lot of people that, that purchase land that know land that, that run ag outfits that, that either ranch or farm or have hunting land, like a, a lot of them know, know sort of like how this goes, but this is more for the audience that is listening that, that doesn't quite get it. Like, tell me the differences between if you're looking at land versus a residential outfit and you're looking at financing that. Yeah, it actually happens a lot. You know, I'll, I'll, speak with buyers and they will have gone to their local bank and found out that their bank doesn't do anything with land or they'll go to a mortgage broker and they're like, yeah, we, we only do residential loans. And they have no idea that residential loans are completely different from land loans. And um, that is, like I said, not 
uncommon at all. Uh, typically banks um, and people that specialize in residential loans, they don't quite know what to do with land. They can't see a house on it. They can't touch a house. So they, they kind of go into that mode of, well, if I can't see it and touch it, it must not have as much value. They don't know how to value the land. Um, and, you know, people need houses to live. They don't necessarily need land. So in a bank's mind, they, they know that if, you know, something happens and they have to take that property back and they, they don't know how to sell it, they don't know what to do with it. So they're a little bit scared of it. Um, typically, residential loans will look at like a debt to income ratio because um, that's all they care about. They, you know, it's, it's a primary residence. It's not something that's going to be used for income, which we're going to chat about a little bit later on. Um, but it is something that, you know, is considered a little bit of a riskier loan with land. Um, so what we look at is a debt to asset ratio, and it's just how much of your assets are leveraged. Um, you know, what kind of debt do you have in compared in comparison to those assets? And that's how we we typically go about pre-qualifying somebody and, and approving them for land. So you know, there's a lot. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, I was just going to kind of piggyback a little bit on what, what Susan said. You know, there's the definite debt to asset is one of the things we mainly look at in addition to income. I mean, you can't get a loan if you don't make any money, but naturally there's in addition to the income, we do look at the leverage side of it. The biggest difference I think between residential and land is the residential industry is, is regulated a whole lot heavier in the in the process uh, than the land side of it is. I mean, there's everyone still has regulations. It isn't the total wild wild west, but through through the residential side, you know, banks can loan on certain things. Secondary markets they're not going to lend on large. They're not going to lend on land. They're going to lend on houses and and you know probably up to five acres. Uh, so because their primary market is residential, so you really start limiting yourself of the amount of people and brokers or, or lenders that will land, land on raw land or land with some level of improvements, but the land has a higher value than, than the level of improvements. So that's really the, the big, big differences between residential and, and the land are, are the different processes. I mean, you still fill out applications, you still got to give a verifications, you still got to provide tax returns and, and you know, W-2s and all that stuff. Uh, but from, from an expectation standpoint, you know, the time frame, so forth, uh, you know, it, it takes a little bit longer because there's a little more detail there that, that we have to go through than, than just a just a residential. I, I'll say residential loans a lot more like a cookie cutter. You fit the ratios, you do this, you do that, you're going to get the loan. Land is eh, it's not that easy. Gotcha. And, and then tell me sort of you, you have a different. You define land a different way than I think what might be expected um, as far as like what qualifies as it's a land of purchase. Right. So. The residence has to be 50% of the value of the land or less, or there's no residence on it, correct? Is that? Yes, that's, so that's that goes into our minimum qualification. So okay. we require a minimum of 15 acres. Um, if a residence is on the property and it's more than 50% of the property in total, then it, it turns it into that residential consumer purpose loan. And so that's where it, you, you, you have the residential loan for that. So you don't necessarily need like a vacant land loan like we specialize in. We do have a workaround on that problem. Um, <laughs> I mean, with, let's say somebody's buying 200 acres and it's got a house, it's got a three quarter million dollar house and the land's worth $500,000 then, you know, we can suggest that if they were wanted to do it, say, hey, take your house, survey out five acres, do that on a secondary market loan and be able to do that from that and then take the rest of the land and then we'll do you a land loan on the rest of it, taking the house out of it. So, um, oh, so you that's break an option. One, the one land purchase into multiple pieces as far as to parcel them out and then exactly. take the loan separately on that. Is there is there a cost savings to that? I mean, is there like a benefit to doing that? The benefit would be secondary market loans. The interest rate's going to be cheaper than a land loan. Uh, you know, any market, whether the we're in our interest rate rising market now or when we've read the Barack bottle, uh, you know, last year, uh, it, it, the residential stuff's going to be a little bit cheaper 
it's going to be considerably cheaper than land loans. Um, but uh, it gives them an option to do that, uh, some flexibility with, with that. And, you know, on, on a residential loan, depending on how you look at it, you might be able to get by with only 10% down or 5% down with, that, with having PMI insurance and so forth to cover it, where a land loan, you're not going to do that with, with 10 or you know 10% down, and we're going to require 25% plus. Yeah, because it's typically you have to put a little more down when you're doing a land purchase, right? If, Correct. If not, if not total cash, then it's usually higher percentage, like that 30, 35% range. Correct. We can do 25% on anything under a half a million, but when you get above half a million, we're looking 30, 30% plus. Gotcha. Gotcha. Which is, is, is that the reason that there's a lot of owner carry when it comes to land? Is that sort of the basis of that? I think that's a, a good reason for that. Um, because a lot of times the owner will be willing to carry it for say 10% down, maybe 15% down, carry it for five years, do a balloon payment. And then, you know, at that point they can get paid off. Um, a lot of times with an owner carry, you can demand a little bit higher price because you can go to the buyer and say, Hey, I, you know, this is my price and this is what I want, but you know, I'll be willing to carry it for you because you don't have to go to the bank to get it, but you're going to pay my price. And sometimes they'll do that. They'll pay a little bit extra more for it because that way they don't have to go to the bank. They don't have origination fees. They don't have appraisal fees. They don't have all of that. And you know, terms are usually maybe a little bit higher rate, but a little bit friendlier terms and probably what they're going to get in the bank. So. Right. Right. I think the I think the last few years you saw a little bit less of that though because interest rates had fallen, the market was hot, people just saw their opportunity. There was a lot of cash in the market. They saw their opportunity to get out of, you know, something and sell it off and just be done with it. And so you haven't seen as much of that in the last few years. Yeah, it does kind of add that complication though, right? Because like if you do owner carry, then you you still are owning your land and you're still you're like you're in an agreement with someone else that you have to continue a relationship with and constantly like worry if I think, are they going to cover their payment or like, it's just, it's not a clean. Exactly. Grade. Yeah. Yep. And, and that, that for a lot of people is just too much of a headache that they don't want to deal with, especially if they can get out of it some other way and, and just be done with it and not have to worry about, you know, keeping up with something that, that may or may not work out Just sell it outright. Don't worry about the headache. Right. And, and what are you seeing rates at? I mean, this, this is going to probably date our episode here, you know, within a year. Uh, but rates right now, you're, you're seeing, you know, I think everybody's seeing rates climb, just general interest for borrowing right now. But um, what, what sort of are you seeing in the land market? Is it increased? Is it accelerating faster than like the residential markets? Is it, um, you know, what, what's sort of your, your take on that? They are the rates. The rates are going at a at a faster pace. Uh, yeah, I say faster pace. You know, six months ago you could get a residential thirty year still in the low threes, upper twos. Now they're four and a half. You know, pushing five. So uh, we were making thirty year loans in the fours, mid fours, six months ago. Now our thirty year loans are in the mid to upper sixes, into the low sevens. Oh wow! Um, so so we've we've really raced up a lot faster than I, I think any of us, you know, in, in landline and, and anybody else in the land lending business. I think we've really, I, I think the mindset was we knew this was going to happen. We knew rates were going to go up. You know, we were probably anticipating, okay, we're in the fours by midsummer. We would probably be in the sixes by the end of the year, we would probably be in the sevens and then kind of see where we were. But with inflation racing up as high as it has, you know, Fed's really tried to turn those things around. And, and, and land brain loans are, are based more on treasuries than, than they are prime. Uh, and with what that's going on with that, uh, they've really, they've really run them up. Uh, you know, trying to, to, to you know curtail some of this uh, inflation that's going on in the economy right now. So it's um, you know it's it's sticker shock for a lot of people. You know, they've been. Buying houses at two point seven five percent, they've been oh yeah, I'm buying land at four and a half percent, four seventy five. Wait a minute, your rate's almost seven. What you know? What are we doing? But I told you, I, you know, I've been been in the land business for so many years. Was in the mortgage business before. We're still at a very good rate as far as <laughs> land is concerned. I mean, sixes and seven percent for all land is still a really solid rate. Um, I mean. 
I'm going to date myself a little bit, but I can remember making loans in the nines and close to 10. And, you know, when I got started in the business, I remember seeing loans on the books that were in 14 to 16% that were done in the early eighties. So it's, you know, it's all relative. Um, but once people kind of get past that sticker shock, I, I still think, you know, Hey, this is, this is still a solid, solid deal. I, I was actually going to bring that up specifically just because, I mean, it's, it's good to have, perspective on on things like interest rates where what the, the late 70s early 80s you had you had loans in the range of 18 percent a lot of the time for, for specifically for residential um and and we've gotten the rates down to this two percent four percent range and like we we increased to four and everyone's like reacting to it and it's like that's still I mean, 15 years ago, that was a record rate. <laughs> like you couldn't find a 4%. So it's like, it's, it's gone up, but it's from, everything's up from the bottom, right? So. <laughs> and, well, I think uh, a lot of, a lot of the advertising the last couple of years was, man, there are historically low rates. I mean, you see it everywhere you go. It's on all the media outlets. It's on every, every TV, newspaper, everything has, you know, these historically low rates. And people have grown so accustomed to that. And, and now when we speak with buyers, you know, and we give them rate quotes and things They're they go through that sticker shock and they're like, Oh, let me, let me call around to a few other places. And they see like, everybody's feeling the pain now, like the rates are rising for everyone. It's not just one place or another. And, and we get those call backs and, you know, Hey, it's, well, let's move forward as fast as we can because, you know, we don't know what's coming and it's expected to keep going up. So I think that people are starting to realize this is this is going to be here for a little bit. It's going to be this way, and we've we hit you know we were at the bottom. It's going to climb some now. I think you'll see. You know, we were in this this environment that we've been in. It's everybody's been doing 15, 20, 30 year fixed rates across the board. I mean, very very few deals. There's been a few that weren't. I can see now. You can go. There'll be some of these guys or buyers, borrowers going back to an adjustable rate. Uh, what are their expectations for the property? Am I going to hold on to this for 10 years, five years? Am I planning on holding on it forever? You know, and, and they're going to, they're going to place their risk, you know, where they're going to be on a rate. I could be at a five-year adjustable rate knowing I'm probably going to keep going to keep the property three years. Well, I'm going to take that lower rate and still do a 20, 30 year amortization, but I'm going to take that lower rate to save myself some money on the front end. Whereas if it's something I'm going into, yeah, I'm going to buy this. I plan on building my house here. I'm going to raise my kids here. I'm going to have my grandkids here. And yeah, I'm going to probably suck it up a little bit and pay a little bit higher on the fixed rate because like Susan says, I mean, I, I think these rates are, are probably going to continue to rise a little bit more uh, before we get to a, to a level and off place. So it's all about risk. It's all about risk management, what your intentions are, what your expectations are. Gotcha. And then, um, you know, when, when someone's looking at land, one of the things to look at, I know, are, are conveyances and rights um, when, when they purchase the land that, that you can have that sort of where it looks like language wise, you're getting, say, 50% of all the mineral rights, but it could be 50% of 50% of 50%. If the conveyances go back far enough and have been like sold like that, is, is that part of the process that you're involved with on the lending side? Or do you kind of like just leave it up to the owner? Like they better do their diligence before they get into the lending process. When we, you know, on any type of, of lending that we're going to have, there's going to be title insurance or there's going to be abstract attorney approved abstract. So there's going to be some research to a point of what's out there against title. Uh, mineral rights, funny you bring that up. Mineral rights, most of the time, they, they'll be documented somewhat in an abstract or a title opinion. But overall, you really need a true mineral search dependent. Because like you said, transactions happen. Yeah, I'm going to give you 50% of what I own. I don't know what I own, but I'm going to give you 50% of it. Right, right. Well, like, and that could go on and on and on. And if it wasn't documented correctly through the chain of title, then, you know, there could be an issue there. So, you know, usually t title companies and abstracts, so forth, title opinions from attorney, they're not going to, and when you get into title insurance, they're not going to insure mineral rights anyway. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you've got a, a mineral search that basically lays it all out. So-and-so owes 10%, 5%, whatever. They're still not going to insure it. So from our standpoint, we look at it as 
really a, a more of a raw land value and not a mineral value. I mean, there are mineral values out there. I mean, we've looked at some loans where people were buying, yeah, I'm, I'm buying this land because it's it's got a gold mine on it. It's, you know, sell price is $3.6 million. There's $10 million worth of gold out there. Well, maybe there is, maybe there's not. I don't know. I'm not going out there to dig, look for it. But you just, it's all, again, it all goes back to risk. I mean, it depends on the value of the property. We're going to have the property appraised for a value of the land. And more than likely, the appraiser is not going to take those minerals into consideration unless there's an active, you know, well or an active, you know, uh, gas well, oil well that's producing income for that property, then they will take that into consideration. Okay. And, and I mean, essentially, if you're looking at land, do your homework above all, because yeah. it's not everybody else's responsibility. It's kind of, it's, it's up to you to know what you're purchasing. Um, exactly. What about the appraisal process? I mean, the appraisal process for land is is different, right? I mean, you, the the appraiser is looking at different things than they would be than say. And again, I'm throwing out the comparison to to residential, but that's mostly just for for an educating perspective of of telling somebody that's looking at land. Absolutely. Yes. So I think that surprises a lot of buyers as well because in the residential world, you can get appraisals back very quickly um, in comparison. And, you know, you'll get this four page document and it, it's very basic. The appraisals that we see on our end can be 30, 40 pages. I mean, it's very extensive and you have to have a certain kind of appraiser. It has to be a, a certified general appraiser. And there's not as many of those in the market. So that was one of the things that really hit us last year, especially, um, you know, the, the market was flooded with buyers. You got a ton of people out there trying to get properties closed. You need appraisals for all of them. The appraisers were just turning down bids because they didn't have time to get to everything. Um, or, you know, in some states, we we got um, one bid back and it was going to take six months to get it appraised because the it was one of the only appraisers in the state. Um, so it, you know, we've got a valuation process on certain properties. We can do a valuation instead of an appraisal. And that has helped speed up our funding times a little bit. Um, and so that has, you know, we, we found the, we saw the problem, we started finding solutions um, and that's helped a lot, but appraisals are a lot different in the land world. And I think that's been surprising for first time land buyers in my experience. Yeah. Appraisals are a lot more in depth. Um, you know, if you're buying a residence at 112 Oak Street, well, guess what? 107 Oak Street sold, 115 Oak Street sold, and 103 Oak Street sold. Well, you do a quick property search, those three houses sold, you make some adjustments for square footage. Yeah, this one was all brick, that one had a little bit of siding, blah, blah, blah. You got a report. Sales comparisons, it's easy. When you get into land, you know, there may not be one that sold across the road. There may not be one that sold within 10 miles of it. It may have been a completely different property. And land appraisers, appraisals are based off three in, or three approaches. There's a sales comparison approach where you compare like properties. There's, you know, pretty like, yeah, there's an income approach, which basically is, takes an effect, just like it says, income. What is the property income producing? What are we going to value that from the income that it is producing? And then you have a cost approach, which is not used as much because that's going to have buildings and improvements and so forth of that, or more or less a replacement cost if, if we're going to do that. So the two main ones that fall into for land would be sales comparison and income. But when you get into a land appraisal, most of the time, they're not going to look at just one approach unless it's, you know, unless you've got a multiple, multiple sales. In the market we're in right now where there's a lot selling, it's, you know, it's a little bit more reliable. But we get in a market when there's not as many sales or the sales that are close to it are a couple of years old, you got to start looking at some other factors that uh, that will help you appraise, you know, give you a good, solid appraisal. And again, people used to get in a residential loan. Yeah, I paid 450 bucks for my report and I had it in two weeks. Well, again, like Susan says, you got to have a certain qualification of an appraiser and they have to go out there and look at the property. They have to go do all the values. They have to do the report and it takes longer. And because this isn't the only appraisal they're doing, you know, they've got a business, so they're doing multiple appraisals. So it takes time and, you know, there we are. We're 30, 45 days out or more. That was something I was going to ask about, and I think you touched it on a little bit, but, you know, you know, working with with agents and, and some of the conversations that we have internally 
a lot of people talk about making land improvements before the sale to either you know boost the value of the property, boost the perceived value of the property. And so it will it will be things like you know improve a fence line or uh, you know put in a, like a water storage pond or make improvements to the irrigation, something along those lines, or even or even you know clear out the crop area for for you know a hunting stand or something like that. Those improvements, it sounds like those kind of function more as a perceived value that you can put into the, like the end price, but it's not necessarily part of the appraisal. Is that am I hearing that right? I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think there's certain things that do contribute actual value. You, you touched on irrigation. Yes, irrigation definitely drives a value for appraisal. Uh, cleaning a fence row, building a pond, building a pond, yeah, because that provides water for, for livestock or so forth or for hunting. Uh, but, you know, cleaning a fence row, putting up a couple fences, stuff like that. Not really. I mean, from a perceived value, yeah, oh, this is really nice. This is a clean property. You know, there's food plots out there for recreation. There's this and that for the buyer. Yes, it's worth more because I don't have to go out there and spend my money and my time to do it because it's already done, just like remodeling a house. Yeah. Um, but but there are a lot of factors in there that, that do actually contribute real value into you know, how they classify land, you know, you talk irrigation, you got non-irrigated and irrigated land. So you have to classify them in different ways. Uh, and one's going to naturally be worth more than the other. Excellent. Yeah. And it's, it, it's something to bring up too, because, you know, when somebody's looking at making a land improvement, it's like, well, you know, I, I cleared the weeds from around that fence post and replaced a couple posts like that to help my value. But, but, the, but there's some of it that like, you're just doing it cosmetically. Like you want to, you're turning it into a show pony versus, you know, just a horse. Right. And, and, or, or you're actually adding a value to it where, so, so it's important from the both the buyer and the seller perspective to kind of weigh those things. Um, so we, we've touched on sort of like the, the purchase process, you know, like how, how the loans are different. Um, how, how does one apply? How does one find the right places to get a land loan from? Who, who should they be talking to? In addition to like, this is a great plug for you guys, right? Um, but you know, how does, how does one find these things? Yeah. So, um, you know, you can go onto our website, www.landlinelending.com. You can give us a call. Um, the, the first step is usually to get pre-approved. So if you're looking for land, seriously, you want to go out, you want to start touring properties. Um, you know, it's, it's not just in the residential market that people are requiring pre-approvals for, for buyers. Um, it's in, it's in our market too. So, um, we can usually get that pre-approval back within one day. You fill out a five-page document. It's it's information about what you're looking for out of a loan, um, consent to run credit, and then there's uh, a bunch of different fields on our pre-approval application that ask for your assets and your liabilities. And not everything's going to apply to every buyer. It's just a way to get you thinking about what you have because a lot of people forget what they have and oh yeah, I forgot about this account over here. Um, so, or I didn't know that was an asset. So you put that down and you're able, we can run the math and usually get back a, a pre-approval letter for you within um, one business day if, if approved. So that's really helpful when you're placing any offers um, or you're looking for an agent and you go to them and say, hey, I'm pre-approved. I'm ready to start touring, touring properties or, you know, hey, I'm ready to put in an offer on this property. Let's do it. And it makes your offer a little bit stronger too, because that seller knows okay, this person's been pre-approved, so we're probably not going to run into a financing issue here. Awesome. Jeremy, you got anything to weigh in there? You know, I think a good resource that anybody needs to when they're looking at land is, is to work with their agent. Ask, say, hey, you know, who are you, you know, who do you recommend? You know, what, what, have you, what experience have you had with these guys or what experience was it with them? You know, what, what can they offer? What, what's the, what's the pros and cons? And, you know, I think going back to what we talked about earlier, I think a lot with, uh, you know, us being in the real estate business as well, being in the brokerage business, you do understand a lot of the ins and outs from that side. And I, I think that gives us a little bit of a head, you know, advantage and some things of dealing with, with the contracts and so forth and having the, the knowledge of, of how all that transpires and, and the expectations, you know, a, agents and brokers want to get stuff closed in three days because they want to get paid. Buyers, you know, buyers want they to get it bought and sellers want to get it, you know, put their money in their pocket. 
but you know, it's all go about, you know, having real expectations. But, you know, I, I would say an agent would be, you know, if there an agent's been in the business for, for some time, you know, I'm sure they've referred many people to many places and they can give you real positive feedback one way or the other. Yeah. And I often, I often see and hear that in conversations about specifically land real estate, when, when you're working with an agent, not only in, in selecting an agent to work with, but just the differences between like, let's say residential and, and land agents is, is, a, is a land professional, you know, land real estate agent is one of their biggest selling points. And one of their biggest assets is the stable of people that they have connections with, meaning your lenders, your surveyors, your, um, you know, people who can do construction on, on the land for improvements or, it's it's very specific to to land the types of people that you have to know if you're a land agent and it's it's an important thing to bring up too is is make sure that the person you're working with has resources right correct they they need to know they need to know how to get people what they need like you said with all the things you talked about a buyer wants they need to be able to uh, be able to deliver those right um and so you know buying buying a property is one thing um, and, and a lot of a lot of lands, kind of you you both have brought it up that that a lot of the times it's not necessarily a primary residence. Um, so so in cases where where you're not utilizing your land all the time, there's there's ways to pull income off of it still, right? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about sort of you know leasing um, for for any given purpose or or different ways of generating income through the through a land purchase like that? You know, buying land, there is, you know, you do have an income options there, whereas you buy a prior residence, that's where you live. Uh, land, you know, there's so many things that income related to it that contribute value to it, whether it's a, a lease of some type. You know, I mean, I'm going to lease out my property for, for hunting purposes. Somebody's going to pay me for the right to hunt. Somebody's going to pay me for the right to farm it. So I have the income there from an annual standpoint. You know, I'm growing trees. I got timberland. So I'm going to have, you know, have the har timber harvested so many years. So I've got some income coming in off of that over a period of time. Um, you've got, you know, anything from, you know, the, the energy sector, you've got mineral rights that you can lease out, gas rights, oil rights you can lease. You, you know, now we're really heavy solar and wind. And, you know, if your property is situated in a location that would be uh, be advantageous for solar next to transmission line substation, then you'd be ideal for a solar plant. Uh, so you could take some acreage out and put in solar. Uh, wind, you know, if you same same deal, wind, you know, wind farms, you, just, you know, put it in there and have, have a wind farm, you know, to, depending on what you want to do. You know, carbon's a, you know, a big word right now. Everybody's kind of throwing carbon out, carbon credits here, carbon credits there. It's a kind of a, a uh, what do you catch, catch word everybody likes to say, you know, I, we still got quite a ways, I think, to get there for what people expectations are for carbon, but it's still, you know, carbon property, you know, is fully timbered trees is, you know, there's some money to be made. And, you know, right now it's not quite where a lot of people want to be, but it's going to increase over time. Uh, and, you know, there's opportunity there to still make some money uh, to cover property taxes and levels of improvements. Um, you know, water, you know, water rights out West, water rights are huge. Uh, sell water. I mean, even, even here, even, you know, where I'm at and in other places where water is a heck of a lot more abundant, uh, people are still selling water for, for irrigation and purposes or whatever. So that's a, that's a big thing. Um, you know, I've seen some other things that have come up in the last probably 10 years. So uh, people are taking their land and, and, you know, agritourism, they're building corn mazes. So during the fall, you know, they're growing a corn crop, and they're cutting mazes out, you know, they got pumpkin patches, they bring the kids out uh, for different things, you know, to experience the farm. So there's a lot of money that's been made off of that, just kind of some small, small market farms, some vegetables, corn maze, the pumpkin patch, you know, just all kinds of hay rides. It's, there's so many things you can do with land. Uh, and, and so many people want to experience that. And, um, you know, maybe they can't afford to, to buy their own land at that time, but they can afford a lease or something. So they still get to enjoy it. So the opportunities are actually endless uh, when you start looking at uh, income opportunities on land. Yeah, it was, Outdoor uh, parties, yeah. weddings, you know, you, you don't you may not have to put the vendors together or do the event coordination. But a lot of people are leasing out the properties or renting it out for that for short term parties, weddings. That's a really good point. Um, and I, I, I had one had not thought about water as much. And you're right back out West out here. I've, I've 
seen brothers that haven't talked to each other in 20 years because of a water rights dispute and, and, you know, good friend neighbors <laughs> going to the same thing. Um, but the agritourism thing, I, I, I haven't seen it catch on as much in the U S I know in Europe, they have the agriturismos like in Italy and, and a few other places where it's like, it's all, it's, it's a, it's a hybrid between going and experiencing an agricultural property and an Airbnb. It's this weird kind of hybrid system that they've really promoted there that I haven't seen catch on as much. And there's probably opportunity for as well. I think so. I, I, I've seen, I've seen more, like you say, in the last 10 years, I've, I've seen a lot of the, of the certain things pop up. And I think it is, it's more and more people tend to it seem to enjoy the time outside now. Uh, I kind of think we're getting into a different generational. It seems like people are wanting to be outside and be more active in certain things. So I think it's, you know, something definitely uh, that's an opportunity there. Yeah. And, and so, it, it, and I was wanting to, I wanted to stay on my bullet points here. So I, I, it was kind of moving on to, to, uh, to refinancing, but I also want to make sure that I haven't like skipped any steps here as far as generating income from your property um, you know, anything else to discuss in, in that area um, as far as making your, your land work for you? I don't want I don't want to leave any stones unturned there. Um, you know, we, we covered a lot with, with agriculture. There's so many things that you can do from there. Uh, recreational leases, um, you know, said all the all the energy type things. So, um, like I said, there's really uh, it's endless. I mean, a lot of people can think of, well, you know, I have my land. I want to build an ATV park. You know, you better have great liability insurance, but hey, I want to build an ATV park. So, and they're out there now. I mean, 10 years ago, you didn't see ATV parks. Now, you know, they're, they're popping up all over the place. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's an option, things like that. People are, people like to have their toys and an ATV and they can't go play a lot of places. Maybe they don't have their own land, but, you know, in, in the national forest and the, you know, depending where you live, if there's not national forest or state parks, it gives you an opportunity to ride. Uh, you know, I think it's something that's out there. Uh, I have, you know, we've had some people call and say, hey, we're, we're looking at buying this piece of land. We want to turn it into an ATV park, you know, or an RV park, you know, or a place for people to, to stay for, you know, camping and so forth. So there's a lot of different things. I, I really don't, I can sit here and probably go through many and over and over and just think of many things we could talk about, but I think it's really endless. I mean, you just kind of come up with something's like, hey, that's a pretty cool idea. Well, I could do that on a piece of land. And a lot of a lot of people have RVs and have nowhere to store them. So, you know, we, we went to these cookie cutter neighborhoods and a lot of places. And I think the last two years have shown us that we, you know, we want to be outside more. Like Jeremy said, we want to be doing more. Um, I have a ton of friends that want to do the RV thing, but have nowhere to store them. So, you know, that you get into some zoning stuff there. But, um, you know, you can usually store a couple couple on your land and, you know, now you've got a little bit of a, a, a lease situation there. Yeah. yeah. Five acres, Income. fence it off and put some gravel down and let people park their RVs there. I, mm -hmm. I, I had not seen that as much until the last five years. And there's a couple places in the area that I do a lot of hunting and it's right in socked right in the middle of between a pasture and a residential area. And they installed an somebody bought the land and then promptly swapped it out into an RV park. And it's one of those like, Oh, I bet, I bet the neighbors are not happy. <laughs> I mean, you get a property with some good views and you, it's that whole like hashtag van life thing. Right. I right, mean, there's a right. ton of people that there's a, there's a whole bunch of people that are going into that whole van life lifestyle and, you know, start advertising that, let them park it there. And, Enjoy and I, those views. Well, then on another opportunity too is in the whole glamping world where it's, you know, like an Airbnb with a tent, right? Where you're getting, yeah. that. so, I mean, there's, and, and that one is exploding. I mean, there's, there's whole business models being built off of that, which is really interesting. Yeah. I understand it. I've seen some of those, so some of those pictures, I get it wholeheartedly get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like I said, it, it, opportunities are actually endless. You just have to have the imagination and the know how to put it in place. But there's there are a lot of things that you can do with land that you can't do with with other things. Right. Well, and so I mean, so we've talked about sort of the, the acquiring the loan, getting the money, getting the land, ways you can pull income off of it. Let's talk a little bit about at the end of that, looking at the possibility of refinancing. I know that we've we've kind of discussed that refis right now are are not as strong since interest rates are going up. There's there's less of an advantage in that case. But what are some of the other options 
um, to sort of like managing managing cash flow, managing liquidity within within your land investment. Yeah, if you've got a land loan and you haven't refinanced it by now, it's you're probably on the on the outside looking in. So from a traditional sense of refinancing, uh, that market is going to be way way slower slower than it has been. Um, but there are still some opportunities out there. Uh, you know, you, you, you've heard of a HELOC, you've heard of, you can get an equity loan off your house. Well, you can do the same thing with your land. You know, you've got land that's paid for, or maybe it's not paid for. Maybe it has a little bit of a loan, but you've got some equity out there. Um, you're with a, with a HELOC, you know, you can usually go in and they'll take a second mortgage and they'll loan you the money. Land's not like that. Your land lender is going to want a first position mortgage. So they're going to want to be the first lien holder, mortgage holder on the property. So, if it's free and clear, they can make you a loan. You know, we can make you a loan uh, for purposes for improvements. Let's say you own a piece of land and I want to build this RV park. So, hey, I'm going to go out and borrow a couple hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to build this RV park. We can still set the loan up. It's a cash out refinance. We can still set it up 30 years, just like we would a regular loan. Um, you know, if you say you had a couple hundred acres and you owed fifty thousand dollars and you wanted to borrow two hundred fifty, as long as it appraised out and met the you know the requirements, then you know, we'd pay that loan off and and uh, fund out the rest of it from a cash standpoint and be able to do that. Uh, another thing that we do have an option for, we do have a lot of credit. Um, let's say you have um, you know some land that's free and clear. Uh, and you want a true line of credit to be able to go do some things. Maybe it's do improvements. Maybe it's, you know, you'd like to buy and sell land and you've got this thousand acre farm out there that well, you want some money to be able to go do some of those things without having to go to the bank every time and go through the title process and go through the appraisal process and go through closing process. You get a line of credit and, you know, take the money, go buy the land. You still want to get title. Uh, regardless to make sure you have clear title, but you don't have to go through the appraisal process. You don't have to go through the closing process. And then if you want to hold it for whatever, then sell it and pay your line of credit back off. So that's an option there that's going to be probably utilized more now uh, in the next coming years than what it has been over the pre previous couple of years because rates were so low. I just go get a loan on it and pay that. Well, now that rates have gone up, well, hey, I like this line of credit option because it gives me a lot of flexibility and, you know, I'm not saving that much from an interest rate standpoint. That's a, that I, I did not actually know about that process. That's really interesting. Um, so, so how does, tell me a little bit about the differences on those, just, just for a, from an outside looking in perspective. If you've got, let, let's just say you've got a piece of land, a couple hundred acres, that's worth $500,000. You can go in and, and cash out. We would loan up to 75% of that if, you know, if there were no liens against it. If there were liens then, you know, or mortgages, we would pay those off and it would still be, we would loan up to 75% to of the overall value. So out of 500,000, we would loan up to that. So uh, that's how that would, that's how that's set. That's a set amount of money. It would be X amount of dollars to you to go do the improvements and it would be funded all at one time. And then you would start making payments on it. On a true line of credit, uh, it, you know, it's, in simpler terms, it's like a credit card. You pay it down, you, you get the credit back and so forth. So we would do a, a loan, say same 500 acres, we'd have to have it appraised, whatever that value was, let's say it was a million dollars and we would loan you up to 50% of the overall value. So we would make you a $500,000 line of credit. Uh, then you could use those funds to go do improvements, talk what I mentioned about buying and selling land, doing some different things. And that prop, you know, those loans there, you would pay the interest on it. Uh, and it would have to be paid down over a certain period of time, but not immediately. You wouldn't have to be making, you know, X amount of payments every month just to make a, a structured payment. You would have interest payments ever so often, but you would have to keep it, uh, you know, keep the interest paid down. And then when you uh, sold a property or, or let's say you took the line of credit and you spent a couple hundred thousand dollars improvements, you built a barn, you did whatever. Well, then you could take that and refinance that under a 30 year loan and then set it up on structured payments at a, at a set rate. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, it, it just depends. Again, it's all about needs and expectations. What do you need and what are your expectations? And most anything we can work around as long as we know what that is and we're clear on it. Which is just, it's, it's interesting, you know, again, I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys hear it a lot as far as comparing residential real estate to, to land. It's just to steal Susan's words when 
when you're looking at residential, it, it is very much like a cookie cutter process where things are kind of lined out. Like it is what it is. You evaluate according to square feet and you look at your comps. And when you're looking at land, like there's so much flexibility to it. Like just the ways you can generate income, the ways that you can get loans for it, the ways that you can sort of structure loans. Like you're talking about credit versus a traditional loan or owner carry or cash or any of those kind of things. Like there's just this enormous flexibility there that you're looking at it with it. Um, you know, what's, if, if you were to bullet point, you know, looking at a land purchase to anybody out there, um, how would you, how would you sort of bullet point it? Like what did you're walking into the process, you're looking at it, what's the condensed version of like, do this, don't do that. Um, do your homework. I mean, you mentioned it yourself, do your homework, know, know what you're buying, know, you know, expectations of, you know, make sure we've got legal access to the property is something we really didn't touch on. Um, you know, we're not going to make a loan or anything that we don't have legal access, whether it's easement, county road, city, highway, whatever. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, I'd love to have that 40 acres back in the hills where nobody's going to bother me. Well, that's great. How do you get there? You know, well, there's this trail, you know, there's this trail that goes through the mountains and got to get up there. Well, is that trail legally deeded for access? Oh, no, that's so-and-so owns that. We just cross it. We can't work with that. So make sure, you know, up front, number one, you, you've got, uh, you know, you do have access. That's one of the first things we always tell people. Uh, and, you know, other bullet points is, you know, do your homework, know what you're buying, deal with, you know, trusted professionals, deal, you know, trusted agents, surveyors, appraisers, uh, you know, lenders, so forth. Just make sure you're dealing with qualified people that, that can help you through that process. Um, and then, you know, look at the expectations of what you want to do with it. You know, this piece of property, this fits my needs. Uh, you have a checkbox. I, I want to do this. I want to do that. Well, I'm probably not going to be able to do that here because the land doesn't really fit what I want to do. Uh, you know, maybe it's zoning, maybe it's topography, maybe it's whatever, but it, it's really land is, is there's so much land out there. I mean, you really, you look at it, it's like, oh, there's houses everywhere. Well, yeah, there's a lot of houses, but there's a lot of open land and you can really find what you want, where you want, if you spend enough time looking for it. And then you said, you just have to set those expectations of really what you want to do and go through that process. And I'll mention from my side, you know, going back to the whole residential thing, like you said, it's very cookie cutter. A lot of people are used to being able to close really quickly, 30 to 45 days, have it done, um, if not sooner with, with some of the cases last year. Um, you know, in land, it's going to take a little bit longer to do some of that due diligence to really look at, you know, the the access, like Jeremy mentioned, to look at any mineral rights, to, to get that title back, to get specialized appraisers out there. Um, so you you probably need to plan for 45 to 60 days. Don't go into a contract and say, okay, I want to close in 20 days or 30 days and expect that, you know, people are just going to be able to push it through. Um, and it's not just us as lenders. You know, it's, it's everywhere across the industry. Um, you know, it's, it's going to take a little bit more time. So just expect that it might take a little bit more time. Yeah. How long did that appraisal take us to get done on the deal in Arizona? Four months? I think, I think the highest bid was six months um, yeah, on, on Arizona. Yeah, it was. Four, it was four months. The bar, the bar was stuck I, with yeah. us because that was, I mean, they were not even able to find anybody willing to lend on the property where it was at. They had talked to numerous people and they wouldn't do it. And we did it. And I found an appraiser, but I said, look, they're going to be four months out. And then it had forest fires that were fairly close to it. So yeah, it was crazy, but we yeah. got the deal done, you know, got them happy. They closed and did what they wanted to do. And, um, it is, it's different markets. I mean, the appraisal side of it is, you know, you get in the Southeastern part and the Midwest, it's a little bit shorter. You go out west, it's it's a long, I mean, I'm trying to find an appraiser right now in California and on some deals, and it's it's a little bit of a struggle. I was going to say, yeah, too, I mean, especially California, a, a small property, you know, a hundred acre property is too tiny for them. But you look in the southeast, and that's a bigger size property. So it's it's all very, uh, it's it's how everybody. It's relative on it price and it's regions. relative. Yeah. You know. A hundred acre property appraisal in California is thirty five hundred dollars. Of you know, hundred acre property in South Carolina is you know fifteen hundred dollars. So, <laughs> I, I was going to bring up too, like you brought up having sort of, it's having a, an ex expectation of patience in the in the closing process. But it's not just that with land, right? Like 
traditionally land transactions just take longer. Like the whole thing can take longer because it, it's a niche audience, right? It's you're selling a farm. Not everybody's a farmer. You sell a house. Most people live in a house. And, and so like when you're, when you're looking at some of the, I mean, it's not uncommon to see some of these sit on the market for, and, and I'm talking probably the higher value listings that are out there, but it's not uncommon to see them up there for a couple of years. Um, you know, especially out West where it's like, it's a vineyard, right. Or something like that, that just, you have to have the, the perfect buyer in those situations. So there is some patience when you're, when you're working with land. One thing we've run into Definitely. also other delay in appraisals is, is delay in title. Because one thing you got to remember, most people with residential houses turn every seven, six to seven years. So there's a pretty clean title chain of every time a house moves. So and so had it six years, they sold it, they had it. Well, you get into land, some of the stuff hasn't changed hands in over a hundred years. So you have to do a chain of title to making sure that there's clear title. Well, maybe somebody didn't take care of things, you know, somewhere along the line, but you know, the will wasn't probated or so-and-so wasn't included. And you've got, you know, you've got heirs out there that weren't accounted for. And to be able to have a clear title, you have to have all those ducks in a row. And unfortunately, sometimes you've got to go back and, and get some things cleaned up in order to do that. And one thing I've, I've really noticed over the last two to three years, it seems like we've had a lot more title issues uh, across the board is, and as I think a lot of it is, is the generation, the landowning generation, a lot of them are getting older and they are passing on and it is being left to the younger generation and their business wasn't taken care of the way it should have been. You know, it wasn't probated. It wasn't willed. It wasn't put in a trust and hmm. so-and-so died and they just kept paying property taxes on it and, oh, everything's fine. Well, now we want to sell it. Well, it doesn't work like that. I mean, for a chain of title, you have to have a clear chain of title of from so-and-so to, you know, to the heirs, to their children, to their children through a process, whether it's a will, a trust, probate, however. And and we're seeing a lot more of that now, I think, as, as this generation, you know, the older generation is passing on. Yeah. And, and it's usually- That was something coming into real estate that I, I, you know, I had no concept of coming into real estate and how air property works. But you know, as to Jeremy's point, you have someone that passes on and it, it maybe it goes to their three kids. Well, then one of the three kids passes and it goes to their children. And then somebody, you know, on the other side, one of the, the aunts or uncles, they pass. And so it goes to their three kids and you can end up with 17 to 18 heirs on a property. And what people need to understand too, is that if you want to sell and you have 17, 18 heirs that this property has been left to, it's going to require a signature from everyone. It's going to have, it's going to require everybody's, you know, unanimous consent to everything. They are going to have to sign. So it's, it's always a good idea to preemptively try to keep that from causing any kind of family issues or, um, you know, issues anywhere else uh, with, with multiple, so many people that could potentially end up owning a property together. Sure. It's a really and this is one of the, and this is one of the things that we do talk to to real estate agents about. You know, they say, "Well, what can we do to help you?" Well, when you're working on a property and you're putting it on the market, do a lot of that preliminary work on the front end. You know, if there is an easement issue, you know, address it, try to get it clean and fixed. If they're go ahead and run a preliminary title on the property, you know, before you put it on the market, that way you can discover some of these problems beforehand before getting it under contract and then i got a contract says we're going to close in 30 to 45 days oh uh, well wait a minute my buyer says you know we're buying it for 1031 wait a minute there's air property out there well that's going to you know that's going to disqualify their 1031 because they're not going to be able to get closed in time so it helps from their side as well to make sure they're getting their homework done on the front end of properties before they're even putting them out there to buyers before they even get to us so it kind of simplifies the process yeah, I, and I think that's a really good way of saying it because I, I, I was going to ask a little bit about sort of the probate side of things, but I mean, really, when it comes down to it, it's not it's not as relevant to the conversation, right? It's it's um, it, it's more just do your homework. If if you're selling, make sure your ducks are in a row because that's going to make the process more seamless. It's going to take out some of that time that becomes a risk as you start moving into the sales process from buyer or seller side that, that you find these hangups that aren't necessarily going to be there or wouldn't be expected to be there in, in sort of your more traditional residential side that, that makes land fairly unique 
as a transaction that, that you can have some of these things come up. So you really have to do a lot of homework just kind of on your own, right? And make sure that you have a good professional to work with when you're doing these things, or you could get hung up on, on some of these issues. Exactly. Well, Susan, Jeremy, I really want to thank you for your time. Both of you have been very, very involved in the financing side of things for a number of years now. And, and the experience that you both have is, is I, I find fascinating just because, it, you know, I just in the course of this conversation learned a ton. And so I, I want to thank you for, for taking the time to, to speak on this. Um, again, I want to give you a, a shout out opportunity for landline lending. Tell me how, how to get a hold of landline lending. Yeah, of course. Um, so you can go to our website, www.landlinelending.com. Um, you can get our contact information there. We have a loan calculator. We have our blog that has a bunch of different articles on it that will give you a little bit more insight into different lending um, issues and uh, how to go about the process. Um, and again, also check out some of our products there. You know, we have up to those 30 year terms, no prepayment penalties. Um, you can use cash or land in some cases as collateral. We have facility loans, those lines of credit, cash out refinance, all those things we mentioned here today. Um, so give us a call at 855-700-7270 or check out our website for more information. And another thing that I wanted to add on top of that, that our, our website offers is if you're new to looking for land, but you know, you want to buy land, I want to get pre-approved, but I really don't know exactly where I want to be. And I don't know who to call. We do have a location where you can enter your information and we have agents uh, across the country that we can help you put you in the right place. So if you come in and say, hey, I want to get pre-approved for $250,000. I think I want to be somewhere here in this location in Texas. If you'll fill out that information, We'll send that to some agents, you know, quality agents that we're that we know and work with in that area, and they'll be in touch with you. So uh, we do offer that service as well. It's a really great point that you can be used to sort of like outsource and find good partners. Exactly. So we, you know, we exactly. want to put people with we want to put people with good people. That way, they get taken care of on that end. And if we're putting them with good people, we know they do their job, which makes our job easier and makes the whole process a lot simpler. That's awesome. That's a heck of a resource for somebody looking. I appreciate that. Awesome. Well, thank you too. I'm going to let you go and carry on with your day. And uh, thank you again. This is a great opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Mark. thank you. This concludes episode number five of the National Land Realty Podcast, discussing land financing with Landline Lending's Jeremy Stevens and Susan Floyd. You can learn more about land ownership or the buying and selling of land at nationallands.com.